Welcome to class number 15. Today we'll be going over the thought process for professional Call of Duty players. Specifically, how do they prepare for a tournament before actually getting to that said tournament? And also, what is their thought process in game? So to kick it off, we're going to talk about preparing for a tournament and what does that look like? So obviously, the first one that I want to go over real quick is routine in the present. Uh, like, what's your routine for that said tournament day? You know, do you wake up? Do you shower? Do you eat breakfast? Uh, you just want to make sure you have a set routine that keeps you in that present moment. For a lot of people, that is, you know, waking up, going to the gym, having a breakfast, not looking at social media, and just focusing on game day. That's a big thing. All right. Now, let's talk about inside of game. So inside of game, obviously, one big thing I'm important on is always having a game plan. Because if you have a game plan where everyone knows where we're going to set up, where we're going to rotate, and how we're going to break, you're going to already be prepared than most, you know, I would say teams um, in the lower bracket of, like, the challenger scene, right? Um, not professionals. <laughs> uh, so one of the first things I would say is, like, hey, guys, you know, for P5, that's a money hill for us because of our setup. Let's always rotate 30 seconds early and just chalk up P4, right? So that's what Red Team is doing. They have a player laying down freezer, watching flowers. They have a player right here just laying down, watching their cut. Um, we have another player right here just soaking up time, also just here to help flowers behind him or side. He's mostly just there to, you know, be that swivel to help people. And then the last thing is player number three is just watching this close door push. So with this preparation you know you guys have every angle set up we know who's watching what and you guys might have a game plan of something like this right where number two he's watching this full flank and as he's watching this full flank if he gets one shot maybe the game plan is okay he gets one shot so number two just gets behind cover plays his life and then number one can like lay down and pick it up in case they sent two players there right and then once number two heals up, he'll get back into spot, and then player no number one turns around. Um, you guys could go that far in depth, but it doesn't have to be that. Just a simple setup of, hey, we have every angle covered, that's perfectly fine, right? Okay, cool. So now we have the game plan of what our setup is, when to rotate, and we all know what we're doing, but how do we adapt to the enemies? Uh, like set up and break, right? So like, let's say we're blue team. Uh, so let's say as blue team, we knew that we we're going to play red team the night before, or maybe like 30 minutes before, and we already know our map set. We could quickly, you know, watch over some VOD review and, you know, figure out what are their preferred setups for each hill. Um, now, being blue team, we could sit there and again, like the night before we're watching VOD review and we sit there and we go, oh shoot, okay, so this is their default setup for P5 if they lose P4. So the next time we understand that we're rotating for P5 and they early rotated and they're full setup, they're set up like this. And now that we know that they're set up like this, this is where you can have like basically a game plan to attack these enemies, right? Uh, so. There's a few ways you can do it. The first way is um, just by literally knowing where the enemies are sitting and pre-firing it and just challenging it together as a team, right? So what I mean by that is basically these two players over here, they would understand, oh, okay, let me dolphin dive across. Player number three is going to drag his aim assist, and then three is going to challenge and get that kill. Boom. That's already one player out of the you know game. Now, as this guy pushes up, player two and player four are waiting for him, so player two can't pinch because we know that these two players are eventually going to turn around. So what then happens is player three pushes up, number one's probably looking at three, and then number one flies in to kill number one, and then number four, ego challenges out to shoot number four, right? And ideally, what happens is maybe number four dies here, and then when number four dies there, number three and one can start pushing up, getting kills. They get this last kill, and then number two can, like, you know, go finish the flank or what have you. Um, it's literally just knowing where the enemies sit so you basically can wallbang them, right? Where I've seen this a few times where going back to this setup, 
let's say that this enemy was laying down right here the and, and these doors are closed number two would just bust open the door the door would be open um and then number three would just wall bang through the door and then just kill number one like it's nothing right and that's just because they're sitting in spots that we predict them to be in now the funny thing is obviously with pro teams constantly planning it against each other and screaming against each other, they're going to change their setups every single time, right? So in the future, you know, red team now knows that blue counters them by sending like two up um, red and two up flowers. So now in the future, it's like, yo, okay, so to change the setup, let's keep this player middle. Let's just have this player play a little bit more tighter close. Um, and then number two, once we get info, number two can just go push for a full flank and then like, you know, cause an error um, in these enemies because they're not watching middle, right? Uh, so that's uh, that's like the whole like prepping, prepping for tournaments and like trying to always be a step ahead, which brings me to the next point of our session today. And that is the thought process of pro players, right? You know, how do we always be two to three steps ahead just like in chess? Uh, obviously, you may want to go five to six steps ahead if you can. Um, and specifically, you know, how are we helping our team to be two to three steps ahead? Like, are you rotating? Are you cutting off a lane? What are you doing? So uh, we're going to look at a few examples today. Uh, the first example I want to use is Sibs 1v4 against Optic, uh, just because I think it's very important to see the thought process and how Sib was able to execute a 1v4 like this. Um, obviously, there's some luck that is involved and there is some fault behind Optic's play, but we got to, you know, definitely applaud him. So getting into this, the first thing I want to point out is Sib the entire time was playing over here at Yellow Van and he actually just got a kill uh, from over here at Hedges. And once he got this kill, Optic ended up killing both Mac and Pred middle, um, I think. <laughs> so uh, basically, uh, there is Mac or two players from Seattle that pushed up middle. Optic killed them. And right now what happened is Optic killed two players middle and they're saying, yo, last player is Sib over at Yellow Van. Sib understands this. So he's running towards middle tunnel as fast as possible because Optic is not expecting a third person to be there. And as we can see, Optic, they're all staring at where Sib was just at. Now, because Sib pushes up towards Tunnel over here, he's actually able to get this pinch and get one kill off the bomb. Now, immediately, once he got this kill off the bomb, he then started to rotate all the way towards Barbershop to then take another challenge. Because once again, Optic right now, they're sitting there and going, oh, shoot, now Sib went from Yellow Van, now he's Tunnel. I got to get bombed down. Once I get bombed down, I'll see if he's still tunnel, right? Uh, we go ahead and press uh, fast forward. Number three, he's uh, looking over tunnel. He doesn't see tunnel. And then he's like, all right, let me just, you know, watch our flank real quick. And he picks up the flank and boom, he just gets melted because Sib gets to this spot before him. And that's what Sib understands, by the way, is Sib understands that, hey, they're looking at me over here. Let me go tunnel. Cool, I gotta kill Tunnel. They're gonna be looking for me at Tunnel. Hopefully I can get to this back alley before they pick it up. And that's exactly what happened, is Dashy was like, oh shoot, he's Tunnel. Let me get to my position, let me get to my position. Okay, okay, awesome, he's not Tunnel. Let me now pick up the flank. And he just picked up the flank too late. And once again, what does Sib do? Is once Sib gets this kill back alley, he rotates all the way back towards Tunnel. And once again, he gets extremely good timing on Dan Ghosty. Uh, so we press play. Sib is rotating all the way back towards tunnel. Ghosty, he's picking up his alley, right? Because that's fair. He's assuming that he's pushing up alley. Sib right now understands that the chances are is Ghosty is watching his flank. He's watching alley, right? He's not going to be looking at hedges. There's no reason for him to be looking at hedges. So right here, Sib is kind of banking on that Ghosty is playing over in this alleyway. And he keeps pushing up, and he actually gets really good Call of Duty timing, perfect centering, and ends up winning that gunfight. I can tell you that if Dan took an extra maybe three seconds 
If Dan took an extra three seconds, Sib might have turned right, look at Hedges, and then immediately get shot in the side from Dan. Um, and it's those little things right there, right? And like that's the thought process that went down and allowed a uh, search to take this map six two. So there's a lot uh, that goes behind the thought process just for like one individual play. But now let's take a look at like a team play, right? Um, again, I'm sorry for using optic again. Um, it, it just the moments that happen for them are extremely unlucky, and it's always down to just simple timings. And it, it hurts to watch, but it, it's important. So right here, uh, just giving some context is we heard the call out rotate, right? Subliners said, guys, rotate. It's 200, 200. This is going to go down to P2. It always does. So Subliners wants to make sure that they have spawns for P2. And Optic, they're deciding, yo, let's just soak up time at P1. So they're sending three people at P1 to soak up time while they have uh, number three playing for the spawns if he can. Subliners, their plan was to have a line going across all three lanes and then to clean up uh, anyone in the back. But uh, they're doing that right here. They push up. So then here's what happens right here, right? It's um, number five understands that he's blocking the spawn. So he's calling that out. Guys, I'm blocking their spawns right now. Number seven, he's looking to see if anyone is middle or pushing up left lane. And then number six, he's just working the back still to guarantee spawns. And number three actually gets a really good spawn at P2, uh, fortunately. And uh, right, hap what happens right here is you see this deadly triangle, right? So essentially what happened is Optic, they were playing tight on hill, and then they were pushing out to get control of like dome, get control of their top uh, house, and then ideally just sit on time. And their, their whole plan is to get kills and then push out towards P2, right? But because they played tight on hill right here, they're sitting in a very uncomfortable spot because what happens is subliners, they're able to play a kill up middle. Obviously, one of them went for that pinch. And then, of course, number eight came out of the water, and he's challenging from this other side as well. Uh, so this kind of just puts optic in a very stressful situation where they have to hold too many different angles and subliners all they have to do is run at the point they're going to be in front of us right and that's mostly why subliners gets this kill and they just had a really good collapse that's ultimately what happened uh so number six gets a very important kill with his um with his kill streak he understands that Shotzi's still in the back at least i thought he did because of the kill streak and he was just like probably got bad timing um, but like, that's where like, we can, again, just think about this thought process all the way down to this point where, um, skies definitely sees. Yeah. So skies definitely sees that there's one player dome and then there's one player over here inside, uh, P2. Obviously he killed P2 and he's calling out, yo, there's one more dome, one more dome right now. Subliners, all these guys over here, they're like focus on just soaking up time and killing the spawners and cutting the map that they don't care about number two because they rely on number six to pick that up. Um, and what happens here is number six, the call out that he got was bottom dome and he understands that that's Shotzi. So Shotzi, Shotzi usually plays, you know, a sub angle. He gets inside a P2 right here, but instead Shotzi decides to play it like an AR and he takes a wider angle, and that actually catches off guard Skies. Um, because Skies was expecting him to B-rush him, you know, play for the spawns, and he ends up not. He goes for a wider angle. Um, and that's why he wins this a very important gunfight, which is uh, pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and just skip forward a little bit, if you guys don't mind, just because mostly the rest of this is just, you know, counting kills, getting control of spawns, uh, eventually right over here, we get another collapse by subliners. Once again, optic, they're just stressed out because they got to, you know, hold all different angles, but they're able to win the gunfights. Hydra is playing for the back over here, uh, but optic has a full good rotation. And right now in optics minds, they're sitting in there and just saying, Hey guys, create a line, make sure we hold the rest of P2 and, uh, just guarantee spawns, right? Um, but right here, number five, he gets a very good kill. He pushes up. 
They're able to flip. It's not over yet. And this is where Optic gets a very unique opportunity. I, I'm not sure who does it here. I don't know if it's three or two. I think it's number three. Uh, Dashi understands that, holy crap, we got two dead. The rest are probably playing at time and pushing over from P1. I need to get over here to block P2. And look at this instant mindset, right? Where he looks at the cut to make sure no one's cutting him off. And then immediately he pushes to block the spawns. And because he blocks the spawns, that force spawns out subliners all the way out over at um, P5 and P3. So just because he got there in time, he gives his team the spawns. And it was this moment right here where we thought that we had the win, right? Because number one, he spawns up. He understands that he can go for a cut. Number two is pushing out right lane. Number four just spawned up, so he's helping uh, the cut front hill. Uh, number two is just playing his life, waiting for this pinch. That was a great play by Shotzi, by the way. So right there, what happened is Dan was probably uh, calling out, yo, I'm pinching dome, I'm pinching dome, play your life. And then once Dan got there to get that first shot off, Shotzi was able to uh, play the trades. And then number seven, this is the heartbreaker right here, where if you pay attention to the kill feed, we killed everyone but Kismet. We killed everyone but Kismet, and Kismet just gets really good timing up this middle alley right here, and um, he gets this nasty two-piece. Uh, it's, it's really unfortunate, and as we're like looking at it, it, it's not a simple pickup of, oh shoot, we're missing Kismet, yeah, he's going to be over here middle, right? It's more so like, yo, where is Kismet? Is he playing in the uh, right water? Uh, we were expecting him to be spawning P3, so maybe he's pushing through Dome, and that's where he got up. Uh, but instead, he got a nasty uh, route up middle uh, that really helped him out. And uh, that concluded the game, unfortunately. Um, but let's talk about this again, right? So number five, he's pushed out. He says, guys, I have all of right lane. Don't worry about right lane. So... Because he doesn't see anything right lane, his team is focusing middle lane um, because five hasn't seen anything yet. And then eventually what happens is five does get a kill right here. He calls out one person. He tries to escape to play his life and basically force Optic to have to basically out position themselves to get that kill. Uh, but at this point right here, we have a fatal funnel. Um, at this point, subliners, they know they won, right? They looked middle, they didn't see anything. They looked left lane, they didn't see anything. Uh, Hydra calls out how many are hitting front, and now we have a fatal funnel where Optic is forced to only hit one lane, and subliners, all they have to do is look at one angle, and that is GG's. Uh, so that was like the thought process as a team, and it's just a lot of moving factors, right? But it's mostly uh, just people playing for spawns as a team, understanding when that when we're in the advantage to win those spawns and when we can do something else like you know play a cut um really intense stuff one last thing i just want to show everyone just to kind of like inspire you to start creating these strategies and everything uh specifically for like let's say mm, actually anything so like let's say it's just like hardpoint hydro right um one thing that we saw subliners do a lot of was they kept collapsing from different angles, right? So like one player would, um, what, what, what would happen was one player would basically play in the water and then he would be able to pinch P1. One player would be middle, he would be able to pinch P1. And then one player was on the full flank, able to pinch P1. And it's like, okay, how do we put ourselves in scenarios like this where we can just play as a team, right? And we just go back to doing that three lane rule, right? Where we have our left lane, we have our middle lane, and then we have our right lane. So with this information that we have right here, if we're playing for P1, we can sit there and say, guys, it's P1. Let's send two middle and then two right lane. So what that looks like is you have your sub AR duo over here. The sub player's clearing out dome. Yo, dome is clear. The AR gets towards top. The sub player starts playing the water. And this AR player is just being a nuisance, getting damage down. This sub player over here is pushing up middle and he's just making sure that, you know, he's throwing his stuns and nades, making sure that he's safe, throwing stun over here, probably throw a nade over here. Once he understands that he's safe, he can go for this full flank. And then number two and number four understand that they need to hard block. So number two now, you know, tries to go for a wider angle and starts blocking and he gets the high ground so he can look for another angle. 
And at this point, what's happening is number two and number four, they're just getting damage down, shooting the enemies, being a nuisance, and all the enemies are going to be focused on them the entire time. And then once number one and three get there in time, number one has a pinch, number three has a pinch, we're attacking them from all three different angles. Two and one, or I mean two and four, they're hard blocking. And what this causes is this causes blue team to spawn out over here back green. And now we have a player soaking up time. We have a player playing in the front spawn trapping. We have a player over here um, just hard blocking, getting ready to play the P2 rotation. And then this player is holding all of the middle and left lane. Um, and like, again, that's just a quick example of how like this is a game board and like you can create your own strats, your own breaks. You can create everything. Um, but that concludes our class for today. If anyone has any questions, please message me. I'm always happy to help. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a fantastic weekend and enjoy watching champs. Thank you and peace.